Okay, I'm going to talk about some research that's ongoing and that uh, as a result that I'm really dealing with um, materials that are in some ways somewhat disturbing. Some of the images that are important for thinking about scientific violence I decided not to even use. Um, but some of the things that you will be looking at are um, seem to pose ethical problems. What I want to suggest is that um, they're not ethical problems, that in fact what you're looking at is science as normal, it's Kuhnian normal science, it is uh, to be expected in the practice of the production of knowledge, and it is the normality or the commonness of these kinds of acts that should interest us. It's what interests me, okay. So, um, so I'm, I'm at not asking you to think, or I'm not thinking so much about ethics as I am thinking about the consensus and the logic that makes these kinds of practices make sense, makes them matter. That's the point. So we will start uh, to begin. I invite you to consider a mysterious image. Uh, this is the abdomen of a cat. The cat has been anesthetized, shaved, marked with a grid, and shot. And the process of it being shot has been documented, as you can see, with frames 2,880 per second from a high-speed motion picture of a cat's abdomen showing the volume changes and movements caused by a 632nd inch sphere. Uh, now, one of the presumed benefits of traditional ethnographic or anthropological research is that you might be able to look at um, processes or actions from a position of estrangement, the estrangement involved in observing things for which you have no readily available explanation. I am asking, in looking at this image, what exactly is happening when an anesthetized cat with a shaved abdomen is painted with a grid, when that event is hyper-documented in high-speed photographs, and also when that image is deployed in a wide range of texts. This particular image is taken from a 1948 paper, but the exact same image, this exact form of documentary evidence, appeared in a series of papers through the 1960s. So it was used over and over again in papers that had to do with what this field is called wound ballistics. Um, today I'm going to look at several forms of laboratory evidence and laboratory work that involved experimental injury and this is injury that could be quantified, mapped, studied, and um, made rational. I guess that's part of the process. And I'm also going to look a little bit at battlefield wounds. Battlefield wounds, battlefield injuries are uh, abundant but uncontrollable. But the, their abundance makes it possible to turn them into scientific resources by means of coming up with comparative wounds or series that make sense in, in, um, in sort of a rational order in relationship to each other. Now I construe the study and analysis of wounds and experimental injuries as an unremarkable practice of scientific and medical knowledge making. So nothing I'm going to talk about today is in its context unusual. Um, it's the commonality of the experimental wound that calls us to attention and it should attract our notice. And my question is, um, unexceptional acts are presumed to involve social consensus and therefore my question is, what exactly is the social consensus involved here? What are people agreeing about? And that's the, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to really tell you, explain that entirely today, but I have a couple of theories. I'm going to suggest three things. First, that violence was cent central to 20th century um, science, to 20th, 20th century knowledge making. The relevance of medicine, engineering, and science to the state's monopoly on violence shaped these forms of systematic human injury in ways that we haven't really mapped yet, we don't really understand. Historians have begun to think about it, but it's, there are still many mysteries here. I'm purposely using the word violence as a reference to Max Weber's famous characterization of the modern state. In an essay in 1919, he said the modern state holds a monopoly on socially sanctioned violence. So I'm referring to him. And, um, and I'm suggesting, and also that the state depends on the threat of violence for its power. I'm suggesting that in the course of the 20th century, violence became the purposive outcome of a wide range of intellectual work. 
And as a result, the importance of experimental violence in research escalated. So I'm not saying science never did violent research before the 20th century. I'm not saying this is totally novel, but I'm saying that in the course of the century, its importance escalated. The role of science in war and also the role of violence or experimental injury in scientific protocols. Uh, my second claim is that the battlefield over the last century became a crucial field laboratory. And this laboratory produced what we might call collateral evidence. It's common to say that war produces collateral damage and whatever sense you want to make of that claim, um, is, it's not quite the issue. Uh, what I'm saying is that the battlefield produced uh, collateral evidence that could become a part of scientific knowledge. The claim is not, for example, that the United States bombed Hiroshima or Nagasaki as part of a grand urban experiment. This was an argument that actually was proposed right after, shortly after the war, that this was intentionally a scientific experiment. I don't think that's correct. But after the fact, both cities became laboratories, arenas for the production of scientific knowledge about infrastructure, about social degradation, about biological uh, effects of radiation, um, about buildings, and all the things that were destroyed in the course of these battles. Um, and then, in the course of the 20th century, battlefields increasingly came to be understood by scientists, engineers, and physicians, but also by military planners, by generals, um, by persons in, in the, you know, the, the army. Uh, they, they came to be understood as open-air laboratories. The battlefield became a testing ground for new technologies, for tanks, for um, protective mechanisms for soldiers, for medical interventions. Uh, for psychological theories, and the claim that war is good for medicine is grounded in this experimental and experiential property of warfare. But the battlefield also interested chemists, psychologists, um, entomologists, engineers, economists, statisticians, fire control experts, um, biologists, many other kinds of scientists came to the battlefield after the mid-20th century as a possible arena for the production of new knowledge to learn things. And one could argue, and I'll argue this, that the battlefield has been one of the most important field laboratories in U.S. history, uh, surpassing in the resources allocated to it even the most lavishly funded academic and industrial research centers. Uh, the battlefield is very, a lot of invested interest in this battlefield. And finally, I'm going to suggest that the experimental wounds that are documented in the published papers, in the archival materials that I'm looking at, um, in, the, in the correspondence that are photographed, um, are, they were evidence of nature for my actors. This is, a, this is an image of the abdomen of a cat that's evidence of what a bullet does to the tissue. Cat tissue stands for human tissue. So for my actors, they tell you about nature, but for me as a historian, the wounds themselves and the images of these wounds and the documentary evidence is evidence of culture. So I, they, they operate in, in, in both frames at the same time. They tell you about truth, they tell you about culture. Now my primary interest is in science and what sort of activity it is. That's my question. What kind of thing is this enterprise that has so deeply shaped our world? And I'm going to begin with a few laboratory projects that shed partial light on my questions. Um, the first is wound ballistics, which is the field associated with this cat. And um, <clears throat> my first point is that wound ballistics is not trauma research. This is a quote from E. Newton Harvey. He was a marine biologist at Princeton University who was put in charge of a wound ballistics um, project at Princeton Laboratories. And the point of the quote, this was in his 1948 paper, is to say, what did they learn from the studies? That a missile should hit head on, but it should turn broadside when it penetrates near a vital organ with the delivery of a large amount of energy in a short distance and consequent formation of a broad cavity. The purpose of the research is to figure out how to produce more grievous injury. That's why you shoot the cats. Um, ballistics experts began shooting animals to test weapons probably in about the 1880s, but there were more serious studies after 1910 at Aberdeen Proving Ground. And, but these were relatively crude. This involved shooting goats and pigs and seeing uh, how the bullets hit them and so on. 
1943, E. Newton Harvey, who's quoted right here, began shooting cats at Princeton Laboratory. Um, he was trying to test how bullets affected flesh at the biological laboratories. Um, he had a team of five biologists and ballistics and x-ray technicians. And they had initially wanted to shoot primates because what they wanted the subjects to be were surrogate soldiers. So they got a couple of great apes from Yale, which had a primate lab. But keeping primates in this tiny biology laboratory at Princeton was rather complicated, and primates were very expensive. So they moved to cats. Um, cats were smaller, they were easier to keep, they were far less expensive, and um, they shot mostly cats, and it's several thousand cats they shot, and then they shot a few dogs. So two primates, a few dogs, and mostly cats were shot in this laboratory. And Harvey's team reduced the size of both missile and target in proportion. This is another quote from a later paper. And the, the crucial thing about this quote is, as far as massive missile and massive target are concerned, shooting the cat is like standard rifle army, army, standard army rifle ammunition and the human body. So they stand in for each other. That's what the meaning of this is. Now, the group used um, <coughs> high-speed cameras to take pictures at a rate of 8,000 francs per second of the changes which occur when a high-velocity bullet enters soft tissue. Harvey's team could make these kinds of things visible with you know, x-ray photography, high-speed photography. They shot all different parts of cats' bodies, heads, thighs, uh, abdomens, you know, to, to see what would happen in various configurations. And they um, eventually came to quantify this damage and calculate the law of force which retards the missile. This was a retardation coefficient of living cat muscle, and it measured the loss of velocity which a spear experienced in going through different kinds of tissue. And the point of this, um, this retardation equation was to make it possible for their data to move to other domains. So Harvey and his team wanted anyone to be able to use the results from their research with the cats to figure out how, how any, for, any missile of any particular mass would affect any tissue of any particular mass. So they're trying to come up with a sort of law of retardation for missiles. And what the point here is they want generality. They want to move from the laboratory into the general prop, into the, the, you know, the general question of injury. Now, um, I'll just quickly say that my larger project is called Rational Fog. That's the title of it. And Fog is a reference to Carl von Clausewitz's 1831 uh, study von Kriege on war, when, where he says war is a domain of fog. You never know what's going on. You're in constant confusion. And um, what I'm, I'm kind of interested in the valorization of reason and the rational management of chaos in the broader project. And here, the wound event is chaotic, very, very difficult to characterize, hard to understand. And the retardation equation is the quantitative rational management of something that is inherently messy, chaotic, bodily, that, that kind of thing. Now, I'm going to turn to a different kind of injury that um, began the same year, 1943. And like Harvey's studies with cats, uh, this is the electric shock studies with um, submarine crews. And just like Harvey's study, this was a part of the mobilization of science, technology, and medicine that occurred during the war under the Office of Scientific Research and Development. This was through the um, uh, Harvey study, were, were through the CMR, and this is NDRC. And um, I call this study the real Milgram experiment. As you know, the Milgram experiment involved persuading subjects that they were, in fact, shocking people. In this experiment, the people were really shocked. And um, this was a, a program to figure out, it was carried out at the U.S. submarine base in New London, Connecticut, and it was, quote, a method for investigating the, the effects of emotional stress um, on submarine crews. So the, the I guess the, the sign of stress or the marker for stress was to be uh, delivered an electric shock. Um, subjects were either shocked or made to believe that they would be shocked, but not shocked, or, or not expecting shock. And the goal was to figure out a way to assess individuals for their suitability for submarine command. Um, what would happen is that a subject would be brought in and the precise amount of shock was calibrated to each subject's response. 
So they would, be, they would be set up and connected to the shock apparatus, and the shock would get to the level at which they got a vigorous muscle response in the thigh. And once they got there, that would be the index case. So all of them were shocked at the very beginning. And then they would sit down, and as you can see here, they would stare, this, this is the subject on the right, um, they would look into the darkened interior of a portable box and the subject would see two spots of green light, one to stimulate the left and one the right. And the subject was asked to purposefully fuse the two lights together into a single dot. So it's a kind of a physiological or cognitive response to a stimulus, to light stimulus. And the subject was told that basically, and here's a picture of the electric circuits, was told that the shock could come at any time, either before the lights appeared or after the lights appeared, in a random sequence. 75 representative submarine school men were tested, and these were men who had already been assessed by psychiatrists as literally bad or good. And I show you a chart, goods and bads. So they'd already been through a psychiatric evaluation in which they had been placed in relationship to each other as valuable or not valuable. And the point of this test was to figure out whether the shock fusion study could substitute for a psychiatric analysis. So could you figure out who was good or bad without having to worry about a psychiatric analysis, just bring them into the lab, shock them, and the real leaders would emerge. Okay, so leadership is mechanical, it's cognitive, it's emotive, and it involves fusing two lights in a dark box. Um, they gave up on this after a while, um, but um, uh, the, what I, I talk about it because being a submarine commander was in some way equivalent to fusing lights. The stress of battle in this experiment is in some way equivalent to the fear of being shocked or the possibility of being shocked. So there are multiple layers here of metric and mechanical assumption. There's a mechanical body. There's, um, there's also a kind of social performance, and, and I call this a drama with administrative goals. So the purpose is to save time on having to find people who are leaders by coming up with a quick mechanical way to test for leadership. <clears throat> now, experimental wounds in aviation medicine often have a similar administrative agenda. And aviation medicine is, of course, the study which began in the interwar period after um, incidents with pilots and crews in World War I suggested that, that aviation, high-speed aviation, posed special or unique medical problems. So there's a very serious aviation medicine program beginning in the 1930s. Uh, by the 19, um, by the late 1940s, researchers in aviation medicine had developed a range of technologies that could mimic the nauseating, destabilizing experiences of flight, high altitude, and especially deceleration. So they had altitude chambers, they had human centrifuges, they had many kinds of devices that could induce motion sickness. That was a very important experimental outcome in aviation medicine. And the first human centrifuge in the United States was built at Wright Field in 1936. And then during World War II, E.H. Lambert at the Mayo Aero Medical Unit developed real-time measuring devices, and this is a picture from this device, um, that could record the sagging of the loose tissues of the face, the reduction of blood content of the ear, the disappearance of the ear pulse, blackout, semi-consciousness, followed by a period of disorientation, which persisted several seconds after return to 1G. Um, one report involved tests of G-force acceleration that led subjects to black out, and uh, it, report, it said that no organic damage has been reported for young and vigorous subjects, although, although they have been blacked out many times. As a result of these experiments with voluntary pilots, willing pilots who wanted to participate, um, scientists concluded that 6G force for 10 seconds produces unconsciousness in all but a few instance, instances. So this is a mapping of the limits of human tolerance, the limits of the human body, how far can you push a body? And this is a very practical administrative question. How, what do you do with a pilot? How much can a pilot tolerate? And what is the point at which virtually all your pilots and all your crew are gonna black out? So, whereas, so you need to know this because you're planning, you, you're working on increasing the speed and all kinds of issues around aircraft. This is very practical stuff. Similarly, conscientious objectors um, willingly starved to the point at which they could not walk. 
in a celebrated research program during the war, and this is, of course, University of Minnesota phys physiologist Ansel Keys. He was later very famous for the Mediterranean um, diet. Uh, and Sarah Tracy is working on a study of Ansel Keys, who's a fascinating person. In his 1950 book, The Biology of Human Starvation, which is still cited, it's one of the very few scientific studies of human starvation, uh, he described his research during the war with conscientious objectors. The work was relevant to soldiers and their needs, but it was also relevant to the anticipated famine, the post-war famine, which was already brewing in Europe, and they knew there were going to be problems with food after the war. In November 1944, he began work with 36 uh, conscientious objectors. These were members of the peace churches, Quakers or Mennonites. And um, they were asked to go six months in a state of semi-starvation. They were on a diet of only turnips, dark bread, and macaroni. And they had to lose, they, were, they, they calibrated it so that the soldier, each soldier would lose 2.5 pounds per week. Um, some people dropped out, but most stayed in, becoming progressively sicker and more debilitated until they basically could not walk, could not move. Um, similarly, in a 1948 study, and here again, the limits of human, human capability, um, this is, you'll see that the two places compared are Florida and Canada. This is about exposure to cold. Guess where the cold was. <laughs> um, 32 Florida recruits, many of whom had never seen snow, were flown to spend two weeks in minus 35 degree weather in a simulated survival situation at Camp Shiloh in Canada that tested the impact of extreme cold on nutrition and metabolism. And you can see what they're tracking in the field for these soldiers. The men were um, exposed to limited caloric intake and extreme cold for 12 days. They were sent out in um, in cold, with cold standard army cold weather gear, cold weather tents, and divided into four groups of eight. They, each group had a physician with them and they were measuring them in real time. So collecting data about um, what happens to persons under extreme circumstances. By placing subjects in conditions that mimic real conditions of bodily risk, researchers mapped the borders of human tolerance, the limits of the human uh, machine, and these boundaries could provide guidance for administrative protocols, for rations, for cold weather gear, uh, for G-force exposure, for the placement of individuals within the hierarchies of the military. So war was a, a domain of bodily extremes and administrative reason, and that's really what a lot of this is about. Now I'm going to turn now to the experimental battlefield where soldiers became the subject of scientific real search, uh, research in real time. Um, they were the collateral evidence of the, of the battlefield. And the entries of the battlefield, as I mentioned, were produced, we might say naturally, at least from the perspective of the researchers. They didn't have to injure anybody to get these injuries. Um, they, had to, they did have to transform them to make them into something that could reveal knowledge or evidence of something. And I begin now with the board for the study of the severely wounded. There's an important character, or several important characters in this picture, but the key star of my story is the third person from the right, who is Henry Beecher. And Henry Beecher was, of course, the Harvard anesthesiologist who played an important role in debates about um, the placebo effect, uh, the institutional review boards, ethics, later, um, when does human life end? He's a very powerful person in the history of biomedicine. And um, Beecher was the leader of the board for the study of the severely wounded. And he, um, he was really the guiding force for it. He had been complaining since early in the war that physicians were losing a golden opportunity to gain information about severe injury. So I have a letter where he says, um, this is the opportunity of a generation or perhaps many generations and it's slipping through our fingers. And so finally, in the summer of 1943, Beecher's appeals were effective, and he was commissioned in the Army. He was sent to North Africa first. And then finally, from September of 1944 to May of 1945, he traveled along the battlefront in the mountains of Italy with his group of researchers, physicians, biologists. Um, there was a chemist along, and they had nurses. They had tents. They, they were. Um, basically, you know, sort of a, a tracking, they said, maximum military activity. In the process, they collected a, 186 seriously wounded men for study. 
Um, Beecher's methods in this field research are instructive. He selected major injuries in certain categories. Um, 50 soldiers each who had penetrating wounds of the thorax, 50 with penetrating wounds of the abdomen, 50 with compound fractures of long bones, 50 with extensive crushing injuries, and 25 with head injuries. So it's statistical, it's quantitative, it's comparable. He classifies the wounds in the field, and then he can reach some kind of conclusion about how to manage them. These were representative wounds, and also it was an important part of Beecher's work that he commonly said that the wounds he had encountered in the mountains of Italy were like the wounds that would be encountered in a civilian trauma center. So they were like the wounds in automobile accidents. And these traumas, traumas can move from one domain to another. They, they move, they track. Now, Beecher's example was invoked as the model when the Korean War broke out. And it seems to me now that Korea is the first fully experimental war. It's clear from early planning in World War II that there was a bit of a battle to get real-time scientific research out on the battlefield. In Korea, there was not. Um, in Korea, planning for engineering, science, and medical research was there from the beginning. It was, it was built into planning for the war. It was an integral part of Army planning. It was part of Air Force planning. You were going to do research. Korea was like a, a grand experiment. Um, so it might have been a relatively minor Cold War proxy event, but in terms of the militarization of knowledge, it is a crucial turning point. Um, and the person who led the medical research team in Korea is actually in this picture as well. He is Fiorindo A. Simeon. He is the farthest to the left. And because of his work with Beecher in World War II, he was put in charge of medical studies in Korea. And um, by December of 1951, his group was doing real-time research at the battlefront in Korea. He was working particularly on methods of arterial vein grafts. And what's interesting in this case is that Simeon and his group were um, experimenting with severely wounded soldiers. They also were having Korean soldiers round up dogs and they were doing laboratory experiments with dogs on the, in the field and doing, and then when it, whatever succeeded in the dog, they would apply it to the humans who were previously injured. So there's this mixture in Korea, if anything validating my point, of both laboratory research, the, the, lab, the scientific battlefield as a, as a massive, science, uh, as a, an experiment. Hmm. Now, field studies in Korea also included work with control soldiers who were not in combat, um, those working in non-combat areas, enhancing the scientific quality of the research, and calculations of standardized wound events. So I'm going to return to wound ballistics. Wound ballistic studies in Korea were among hundreds that were integrated into war plans. In the charts and diagrams that made up their final report, the wound ballistics team for Korea presented data on 7,773 wounds in 4,600 persons. Through their careful analysis of frontline events and soldiers' bodies, they found that much of the ammunition on the battlefield was basically wasted. Most fragments from most bombs hit no one. Um, and at least in Korea, small arms killed or wounded very few soldiers. Only 7.5% of all casualties were caused by small arms, and 92% of casualties were the result of mortar and grenade fragments. So the, the lesson from this is that you're going to have a much more effective uh, fighting force if you emphasize mortar and grenades over small arms. Wound ballistics groups also used historical data to map the vulnerability of the body. And this is an image that interests me because of its resonance with natural history images. This is fragments recovered from a German high explosive shells, shell categorized, organized by size, laid out in a kind of a graph for display as a, a way of making evidence in the same way that geologists or person who, persons who collected shells might lay out for display a selection of related, related objects that by their display you come to understand the relationships between them. This is a similar um, display, if you will. These are um, missiles, secondary missiles, found in aircrew personnel along the fatal wound tracks caused by primary missiles. So everything in this image has a historical relationship to everything else. It was all found in, um, in a wound track for a fatal injury. 
um, but it is not part of the original, um, I guess, insult. It's not part of the shell or uh, this is, these are things that came from the clothing or from the, the plane in which the person who was killed was traveling. So this is another kind of chart. It's historical. It's got a some kind of a causal relationship, and they're displayed in this way with measurements. Um, now, this is a different kind of composite, composite image, and this is a, a face, a cartoon face on which 85 wounds due to plexiglass fragments and 75 wounded in action are all put on a single image to show patterns, more or less, of what the plexiglass did to persons when they were hit. This is a part of wound ballistics. And then uh, a related image, these are the anatomic location of 6,003 hits on 850 killed in action due to shell fragments at the, in the 5th U.S. Army in Italy. The purpose of this mapping of injury on the body is to determine where an injury would be most likely to be fatal. And you can glance at this map and you can see data, which is that the most likely site for a fatal injury would be around the neck and the head. And so they're mapping this to try to figure out how do you injure people more um, quickly. There was the same type of mapping with um, aircraft. And so you can see flak hits marked on the aircraft in a similar way to reach a conclusion about how to protect planes, how to make them more vulnerable. So you have a, this is not, mapping on the, the body of the human is consistent with an overall form of data collection, post-battlefield data collection, a way of making sense of injuries and risk in battle. Now I'm going to begin my conclusion by referencing a phrase that appears again and again in professional society codes of ethics or statements of purpose. And that phrase is the welfare of mankind. Um, as many of you probably know, many um, scientific societies came into being roughly after 1870, between 1870 and say uh, 1900 or 1910. And in those early articles of incorporation, the welfare of mankind is only rarely mentioned. But after 1945, scientific societies, uh, in, almost in tandem, began to include that phrase in the explanations of what science was supposed to be. So for example, the Association of Pasadena Scientists founded late in 1945 as a response to the controversy over the use of atomic bombs um, was intended, it said in its Articles of Incorporation, to help experts meet the apparent responsibility of scientists, apparent, in promoting the welfare of mankind and the achievements of a stable world peace. Uh, later, the American Society of Microbiology, after several decades of debate um, and contention, published a code of ethics that took an explicitly moral and critical perspective on biological weapons research. Two provisions of this code are relevant. Uh, first, it said that microbiologists, quote, will discourage any use of microbiology contrary to the welfare of mankind. And second, microbiologists are expected to communicate knowledge obtained in their research through discussion with their peers and through publications in the scientific literature. So in other words, they won't make biological weapons and they won't do secret research. Um, other societies like the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Chemical Society also adopted codes, ethics codes, statements of purpose that used that exact phrase, the welfare of mankind. Now, my question is, was it necessary to have a code of ethics and a special society promoting it to, to suggest that science was pursued for the welfare of mankind? That science was intended to do things that helped human beings? And that scientists, physicians, and engineers should not pursue research that was focused on facilitating greater injury to human beings. So when you see, you watch the professional societies and you see a response, a reaction to this creation of experimental injury that is the heart of the deepest tension that I'm trying to understand in my larger project. Experts trained and socialized to see their labor as benefiting humanity were it often in practice committed to the systematic technical production of human injury and to the scientific study of how to maximize it. 
Such injury could be produced in a dizzying array of ways, okay? Weapons are not the only issue. And now I'm gonna talk about the broader question of how you produce this injury. Technical innovations that protected or healed some individuals were commonly intended to allow those individuals who were protected or healed to continue to injure others. So, for example, Malcolm Grove was a Philadelphia physician who got bored with his practice in, in, during World War I and went off to fight on the Russian front. And when he returned to the United States, he became a key researcher in aviation medicine. Grove developed a wide range of protective gear, body armor, and specialized rations that would permit bombing crews to undertake very long uh, sorties successfully. And so that they could tolerate more cold, you could protect their necks, they had things to eat. So in healing and protecting one group, flight crews, Grove facilitated injury to another group, that is people on the ground. The purpose of protecting them was so that they could continue to drop the bombs as they were scheduled um, to drop it by enhancing their survival. Now, I believe that many times in many different ways, science and technology has this lumpy effect, an inconsistent effect. We don't usually think of it this way, but once I started thinking about knowledge to heal and knowledge to injure and the way they work together, I started thinking about the way other kinds of technical expertise have effects that vary based on things like class, nationality, race, gender. So things that are good for one group may be bad for another group. This is not really unusual. It's not unique to the sciences built around war. The impact of technical inter inter in innovation is lumpy. That's my word for it. It's lumpy. It's inconsistent. It's shaped by the ways we organize people into societies, nations, social groups, and so on. And um, it, it characterizes many industrial enterprises, for example, which might produce consumer goods that benefit one population and environmental damage that, that um, causes damage to another population. And that's, it's just generally there, it's all over. We don't think about it so much. But it's certainly present even in medicine where technologies can benefit some individuals and hurt other individuals. But nowhere is it more overt and more dramatic than in the technical empires built around war. It's different around war, it has different properties. Economists helped guide World War II bombing runs because if you knew how economies worked, you knew how to undermine them. Urban fire control experts who knew how to prevent cities from burning also knew how to make them burn faster. Psychiatrists who understood the critical cornerstones of psychological health also planned dirty tricks, propaganda campaigns, and partic participated in torture. And that's even an issue today for the American Psychological Association because it's a continuing issue. The fact that the persons injured in many of these cases would be people identified as enemies of, in my case, the United States, or as enemies of the state pursuing this kind of injury is not particularly relevant to my point, <clears throat> which is merely um, that in modern high-tech warfare, healing and injuring often function together simultaneously. And the wistful ethics codes with their invocation of the welfare of mankind could be an index of this state. It was not at all clear what kind of research was conducive to the welfare of mankind because much militarized research produced both, both healing and injuring at the same time. And, and I don't, this is a kind of analytical thing that I'm working through, so I'll welcome your insights on that. In his philosophical study of the haunting combination of violence and transcendence in the life and work of the physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, uh, the historian Charles Thorpe explores the idea that reason and science were expected to provide, to provide a solution to the problem of um, violence. Uh, the sociologist Max Weber's work can be read as an effort to resolve the problem of the worldly demands and the diabolical forces of violence. George Sarton, the founder of academic history of science in the United States, proposed in 1948, and I quote Sarton, science makes for peace more than anything else in the world. His student Robert Merton echoed those ideas in his formulation of the universalistic norms that drove technical knowledge production. Many of you have probably learned Mertonian norms at some point. 
And Steve Shapin and Simon Schaffer, in their story of the scientific revolution, proposed that experimental philosophy was understood by its practitioners to be a means of a securing assent without recourse to violence. So that was the point of reason. Reason was a way to get people to agree without coercion, without force, without violence. The power of the experimental matter of fact to command rational agreement made experiment a platform for the reconstruction of peaceful social order. Science and peace are linked in all these kinds of stories about the rise of modern science, the place of science in society. But in practice, science, technology, and medicine have all been deeply involved in the production of injury and in war. And matters of fact have commanded compliance through the threat of violence or through actual violence at an increasing and expanding rate. Rational agreement and socially sanctioned violence have worked together. Now, I'm going to turn finally to the early 20th century biologist and philosopher Ludwig Fleck. Um, Fleck is an interesting thinker, and one of the things he suggested is that those things understood by social consensus to be, um, as he puts it, neutral or rational, or especially for him, outside the realm of emotion, those things understood to be outside of emotion, are precisely the things around which crucial values and assumptions are expressed. So Fleck, in his shrewd psychosocial anal analysis of knowledge, proposed that emotion is everywhere in every act, and if and when emotion seems to disappear, then that point of disappearance is a point of crucial consensus, critical consensus. So for Fleck, in a way, it's as though neutrality and rationality were almost cultural blind spots. Uh, they were notions around which the consensus was so thick that emotion could seem to be absent. But what was the nature of the consensus that made shooting cats or starving soldiers or making pilots vomit emotionally flat or neutral? What were the participants agreeing about exactly, and how does the body look in this militarized logic? <clears throat> when the Yale physiologist John Fulton was um, in a letter to a colleague about a wound ballistics program, he described the brain as a semi-fluid substance suspended by inel fairly inelastic attachments in the cerebrospinal fluid in a rigid box. This was a way of seeing the brain as a target for a bullet. So how does the body look in this militarized um, logic? And so Fulton is selecting those properties of the brain that, that are relevant to his analytical frame. The intersections of violence and truth over the last uh, century have produced phenomena that should puzzle us, give us pause, lead us to wonder how the ideals of natural knowledge and gentlemanly consensus became central to the state's monopoly on violence, how this shaped individual careers and trajectories for scientists, uh, what it meant for individual scientists, and what it has meant for us um, today. This is an apparatus for the production of experimental flame burns in research that was conducted, as you can see, by a physician um, uh, during, no, just after World War II, and the animals would be placed in this little machine and burned at various levels and in various ways to try to um, study the burn effects. And this, again, is not trauma research, the same research program, constructed artificial Japanese-type bee bunkers, staked animals inside them, and tried to figure out how to make the flamethrowers do the most damage to imaginary future Japanese soldiers. So um, wound ballistics, um, fire research, this is about how to increase the potential for doing damage to future enemies. The experimental wounds that I consider are evidence of a way of making sense of human relations and human knowledge. They make manifest what is possible, uh, what is obvious, and what is unremarkable in 20th century science. And that's my last image, it is a femur being, of a cat being split by a high velocity uh, missile. Thank you.